I've recently been playing Rain on Your Parade, a game where you play a mischievous cloud causing all manner of weather-based hijinks. It reminded me fondly of Untitled Goose Game, where you play as a goose that wants nothing more than to terrorise a small British village. And it got me thinking, what is it about these games from a psychological perspective that instils so much humour from being such jerks? Why when playing as a goose that bathes in people's ponds or gets into a tug of war with a shopkeeper and then breaks her broom, is it so funny to push boundaries? The human mind is a result of millions of years of evolution. It's led to amazing architecture, technological advances, and allows us to appreciate art, music, literature, and laugh at all kinds of things. Developmentally, human babies are likely to spontaneously laugh as one of their first acts of social vocalisation, anywhere from two months of age. And Piaget's work has shown how from an early age we are trying to make sense of the world, and we continue to be scientists all the time. If I get this shopkeeper to follow me into here, would I be able to lock her inside the garage? Turns out, yes, you can. If I snowed on the road, would it cause a car to crash? Yes, it does. And it explodes as well. So when you're getting up to all these shenanigans, are you both the playable character and the player at the same time? In psychological research, there's some arguments that players shift their sense of self to that of the character's traits temporarily. Which means that we metaphorically become one with the character and take on the desires of the cloud or the goose to cause mischief. So it means you, for a period of time, become the cheeky cloud who goes around filling up drinks with dirty mop water or the untitled goose who steals a carrot for his own personal picnic. Others argue that the characters become digital extensions, an alternative projection of oneself if you like. So whilst you're playing you use that time to experiment with alternative versions of yourself. So that would suggest you're projecting a version of yourself onto the goose as you wait around for the right moment to wed a groundskeeper with his own sprinkler, or a version of yourself as a cloud that encourages birds to poop on people's heads. In these games, you certainly have the power to influence the environment, and as they say, power corrupts. Within psychology, it's suggested that a position of power is one that can impact others by providing or withholding things such as food, money, opportunities, or administering punishments. In Untitled Goose Game, just when the groundskeeper is at the end of his tether as a result of your ongoing mischief, he puts up a no geese sign. And in a final act of rebellion, you honk just as he goes to hammer it, leaving the poor groundskeeper to hammer his thumb, fall over, and knock down the gate to his garden, allowing you, as the goose, to progress. And in Rain on Your Parade, you can punish people for no reason other than to mess with them, whether that's ruining a gig, or a kid's birthday party by setting fire to all their presents. And the kids as well. Being in a position of power, even if it's a small one, has been explored in what's been referred to as the Cookie Monster Experiment. Groups of three were randomly assigned a leader who was tasked with assigning points to the others during a tedious task on social issues. After the task, the researcher came and gave a plate of five cookies, so at least one participant was able to comfortably take a second cookie. Turns out, those randomly assigned with power were more likely to take a second cookie, not only that, they were also more likely to eat with their mouths open and get crumbs on their faces and on the table. In Rain on Your Parade, you can use your power to ruin people's camping trip by using lightning to set fire to the trees and rain on their campfires. Or in Untitled Goose Game, you can get the power of the honk to scare a child into trapping himself into a phone box. If he didn't have a phobia of geese, he probably does now. Humour is shown to play a considerable component in people's lives influencing entertainment choices, who we select as friends and potential partners. Despite this, psychological research into humour has only really picked up within the last 30 years, and it's shown to have considerable social, psychological and physiological benefits. It can help with pain, adversity, interpersonal conflict and ease criticism. There are numerous theories that have been proposed to explain humour. One of these is the superiority theory. This suggests that we tend to laugh at others' misfortune, thus asserting one's dominance over others. For example, in Rain on Your Parade, you can ruin a wedding day by raining on the bride, the groom, and their guests as they all run about screaming, probably regretting that the wedding is outside. So we might laugh at the ignorant action of others, or maybe it's a playful triumph over others, such as locking the groundskeeper out of his garden, and then showing off that you have his keys so he can't get in. Release theory is another consideration in the study of humour. 
it suggests that humour occurs when repressed desires are released. It would definitely explain factors such as why it would be amusing to cause car accidents, or laugh when you finally get that poor lad to trip over and then steal his glasses. There's also incongruity theory, which suggests that humour occurs from conflicting interpretations or a mismatch between what a person expects from the world and what is experienced. For example, you don't expect Cloudy to appear as a cast member in a pastiche of The Office, and then star in an episode where they cause a fire. The argument from an incongruity perspective is that it's funny due to the difference between what's expected and the actual consequences. However, it suggested that the previously mentioned theories of humour don't account for considerations such as distance, i.e. how close to home something is. For example, unintentionally killing a pet fits with incongruity, superiority and release of repressed tension, but isn't likely to be funny. One of the most popular theories on humour is the benign violation theory. It suggests that anything that is threatening to one's sense of how the world ought to be will be humorous, as long as the threatening situation also seems benign. These violations can be anything from physical threats to challenging social, linguistic or moral norms. You can definitely see social norms being challenged in Untitled Goose Game as you really push the boundaries of British etiquette. The goose is just there to cause chaos and get up to mischief and these villagers are just trying to keep up appearances. Despite their best efforts to just ignore you, you keep doing these things that just inconvenience them even further. Take this poor gentleman for example, just as he takes a sip of tea, you ring a large deafening bell, surprising him so that he spits out his tea. Suffice to say, he doesn't seem best pleased. Whilst Untitled Goose Game seems to be much more about violating social norms, Rain on Your Parade seems to align more with the threats towards moral norms. You use Cloudy's weather-based abilities to ruin events, cause accidents and set things on fire. You can even create trails of snow so that a child's sledder slides down a hill and gets, well let's just say lost. So benign violation theory would propose that these fit as violations and are both technically benign, as no one is really hurt, so they're humorous as they're both simultaneously okay and not okay. In one study that was published in Psychological Science, participants read an online exchange in which a young woman realised she had accidentally donated money to a charity via text message. When the mistake was done by a friend who donated $50, it was seen as funnier than if they accidentally donated $2,000. But when it was worded as someone they didn't know, $2,000 was seen as funnier than $50. So psychological distance is argued to be an important component. Essentially, it was argued that if something hits close to home, then it shouldn't be too much of a violation or else you're less likely to find it funny. Yet if there's distance, then it should be big enough so that it's not boring. Humour can be a tricky thing to get right. Whilst it has many benefits when you do get it right, getting it wrong can lead to contempt. Both Untitled Goose Game and Rain on Your Parade can be really amusing, whether it's the array of weather-based antics as a cloud or pushing social boundaries in a tranquil British village. Those small moments where the goose and groundkeeper will just stare at each other are absolutely magnified as a result of the context and are just sublime. There's an endearing video by Hamish Black in Writing on Games, where he took a look at comedy through play, which is really worth checking out, so I'd definitely suggest giving that a watch too. It's understandable that we might consider humour as something more of a modern day phenomenon, but even Darwin argued in favour of the evolutionary significance of laughter, suggesting that our primate ancestors were tickled when playfully touched, and humans are tickled by the mind. Of course, it could just be that you're being a jerk in these games because it's expected of you in the context of the game and in order to progress. Either way, I hope you enjoyed the video. You're welcome to like and subscribe for more psychological-based gaming content, but until then, please honk off.